borrowed figure of the body without organs appears throughout Deleuze and Guattari's capitalism and schizophrenia books, as well as at crucial junctures of Deleuze's solo ventures, but has disappeared by the time of their final collaboration, What is Philosophy? This latter book, shortly after its first mention of Antonin Otto, the progenitor of the term body without organs, makes a turn toward the cataloguing of error. Concerning this infinite list of illusions of thought, Deleuze and Guattari note that, first of all, there is the illusion of transcendence, which perhaps comes before all the others. And they go on to pass this illusion of transcendence into two distinct yet linked moments. The illusion of transcendence has the double aspect of making imminence imminent to something, and of rediscovering a transcendence within imminence itself. Making such a distinction is hardly an unexpected move from these writers. Indeed, the two-ness of things is a fundamental mode of Deleuzean and deleuze guattarian thought, quite foundational to their ontology. And it is for this reason that we might find it so surprising that their understanding of the context, indeed the very concept from which the body without organs derives, is so cyclopic. But tie me down if you want to, but there is nothing more useless than an organ. So run the oft-quoted lines from the final section of the broadcast version of Artaud's To Have Done With The Judgment Of God. These lines are immediately followed by the sentence which contains the first, term, first use of the term body without organs. But it is rather the lines that precede which are more telling. Here, Arto announces the remaking of the body. By having him, man, undergo once more but for the last time an autopsy in order to remake his anatomy, I say in order to remake his anatomy, man is sick because he is badly constructed. We must decide to strip him in order to scratch out this animalcule which makes him itch to death. God and with God his organs. Perhaps the most instructive thing which Deleuze and Guattari have to say about the BWO in A Thousand Plateaus is that it is not at all the organisms themselves which Arto is railing against, but the organisation of the organs, that is, the organism. They're quite wrong, or at least only half right. And this for the very same reason that highlights their misunderstanding of the superstructure, that's the text or the broadcast, and the wider Artovian project of having done with judgment. It all revolves around the question of the double genitive. In English, as in French, many other languages, there is a bilaterality to of. For Artaud, the judgment of God is not solely God's judgment presiding over man. It is also man's judgment of God. That is, the tendency of thought toward the one or the infinite. So thought tasked with bringing the one and the infinite into identity. It is the tendency to the foremost error, the temptation to think transcendence, which, for our toe, is most often associated with the forgetting of the body and its opening up to malevolent forces, be they critical, clinical, inspirational, theological, etc. Similarly, the organisation of the organs should be understood, in fact, I'd say it can only be retained, uh, Pake, Deleuze and Guattari, as both the organ's suffering arrangement, as is understood by organism or anatomy, and the organs as themselves, forces of organisation. For Artaud, the tendency to think transcendence occurs not only under the name of God, but is also the problem of humanism, the vector of the scientific relation to truth that is the enlightenment. And he writes, and every man is that evil thought which pretends to be spirit, science, when it doesn't have a body. Similarly, the organisation of the organs is not only the organisation which relates one organ to another and locks them into some sort of metastable equilibrium. It's not only their mutually assured conservation of the body as what it already is, that is, what it has been given as, but also the intensive differentiation by which each organ on its own is organisation, is similitude. The presence of God and the repetition of an image, not of the body's own making. So the organisation of the organs is indeed the problem. The articulation of each element in relation to another, which locks them into this singular totality, 
a bounded and molar entity called the organism, which is oriented towards survival as is, and which is subjected to and by judgment. Indeed, we could go so far as to say that if this were all Arto had to say on the matter, Deleuze and Guattari may even be right to make their catastrophic mistake of naming Spinoza's Ethics, the great book of the BWO, and to claim that all BWOs pay homage to Spinoza. But there's also the other side of the double genitive, the fact that each organ on its own is a force of organisation, a regulatory difference engine of metastable equilibrium. The body without organs is not merely a case of gaining a certain fluidity of organ-to-organ -organ relations, of atomising and rhizomatizing the molar body. It is also, as Arto plainly states, a case of scratching the out this animalcule. For each organ is, of itself, already God, the whole in the part, God within the organism, within the body. God already within every erythrocyte the liver produces, in every pang of hunger, in every thought, even in the synovial fluid of the knees, as Arto tells us. And this is what Arto is telling us as he draws to have done with the judgment of God to a close. When you have given him a body without organs, then you will have delivered him from all his automatisms and restored him to his true liberty. Those automatisms which the body tends towards in its conservative, survivalist, metastatic equilibria are the productions, and not only the articulations inter alia, of each organ. Each organ is itself riddled with God and must be removed or scratched out. God, Arto insists, is microbial noxiousness, just as humanism is. For if nobody believes any more in God, everybody believes more and more in man. We see here already how Deleuze and Guattari's commitment to joyful vitalism will not be capable of fully accounting for Arto. For as Arto writes uh, to Peter Watson, he can remember being dead in this life really and corporeally at least three times, a theme which recurs throughout his poem cycle of the same period, Arto of Le Momo. Um, Momo is uh, Marseille's slang for idiot or fool. Um, and for Arto, it's also clearly a play on, on, on mummy. So, mommy, as in figure of the undead, but also mother. So what is at stake concerning the body without organs and in the dissonance between Arto and Deleuze Spinoza is the relation between a body and experimentation in the formation and inhabitation of a plane of imminence. Not coincidentally, perhaps, Deleuze does pursue his Spinozism in terms of affective bodily animal regimes of sense, that is, ethology. In the final chapter of uh, Deleuze's Spinoza Practical Philosophy, published shortly after the first volume of Capitalism and Schizophrenia, Deleuze takes up Jakob von Utzkull's treatment of the life of a tick. For Deleuze, the world of the tick, its Umwelt, as von Utzkull would call it, is its affects and capacities for being affect, its capacities for affecting and being affected. It is made up of three affective relations, with light, with the olfactory, and with the thermal. These three affects, that is, the tick's capacity to be affected by them, determine the insect's behaviour. Guided by light, it climbs to the top of a branch. Drawn by smell, it lets itself fall onto the mammal that passes beneath the branch. And led by thermosensitivity, it seeks the area without fur, the warmest spot. The longevity of this three-affect world is dependent on transgressing neither an optimal nor a pessimal limit. As Deleuze writes, the gorged tick that will die, and the tick capable of fasting for a very long time. Now it's noteworthy that the tick's longevity is linked to op optimal and pessimal limits, limits of degrees of intensity. Transgressing either means death, but it is not a case of observing an even-handed temperance or of following a particular meridian path between these two limits. Rather, it is a matter of getting as close to the optimal limit as one can without ever exceeding it. The maxim to know your limits, rather than to be moderate. It should be noted that Deleuze pass from Spinoza's own thought here, and that the latter explicitly advocates pursuing the middle way. 
See, for example, his praise of temperance, sobriety, and presence of mind in danger in part three of the ethics. So the pessimal limit, it seems to me, is solely instrumentalised here. It is seen to produce nothing as and of itself, but merely serves the feeding. It is valuable only toward the promise of feeding. Arto's objection to such thinking is as clear as it is dripping in sarcasm, as though there were not people who eat without any kind of appetite and who are hungry. Asceticism, in general, for Deleuze, is only seen to be useful as that which can expand the field of possible satisfaction of its opposing vector, that which might serve the optimal position which lies just short of gorging, so the gorge tick that will die. Whilst not an advocacy of temperance, then, Deleuze's Spinozist pathology is nonetheless clearly aligned with the survivalism predicated on the capture of a species for implementation towards particular conservative needs. Sorry, conservative ends. It is not a mode in its own right, but the subject of a cost-benefit analysis. And we might note here that the French word for lunch is constructed, similarly to the English word breakfast, on the negation or limitation of the fast. So déjeuner, uh, from jeûner to fast. What the English word fast, and its embodiment in the figure of the faster, gives us is the unmistakable inference of modifications of relative speed rather than simply orientation towards survival. This figure is beautifully and devastatingly treated in Steve McQueen's film, Hunger, as an incursion or a raid on the political and on the power of naming. The deleuze spinozist notion of experimentation is rendered by its teleological instrumentalization of a species incapable of grasping this faster. Deleuze writes, the approach of pathology is no less valid for us, for human beings, than it is for animals, because no one knows ahead of time the affects one is capable of. It is a long affair of experimentation, requiring a lasting prudence. A spinners and wisdom that implies the construction of a plane of imminence or consistency. Again, there is a crucial link for Deleuze between experimentation and wisdom, between the body without organs and care which in some ways is the sort of monotonous message of a thousand plateaus. This is a link which we cannot hesitate to indict as the preference for something much more insidious than mere temperance, namely the subservience of the unwise to the wise, to survival. In this case, it is asceticism which is brought into the service of survival, but in a more general sense, it will always be dissipation, refusal, the unproductive, or sadness, and the Deleuze spinners of uh, terminology, uh, will always be these which are ultimately, ultimately made subservient to accrual, conservation, and longevity. And note anti production or disjunction are precisely integral and formative of the BWO, even in anti Oedipus. It is difficult to see how a real experimental approach can subsist under this wisdom, when experimentation will always be tempered by survival. When the vector, in this case the fast vector, must always be bent back against itself before any eventual concatenation of breakdown, breakthrough can be properly risked. The tick that can fast for a very long time is given more opportunities to eat, and that, for Deleuze Spinoza, is all. It suffers this fasting only under the promise that it will end, that the vector will be bent back. This is the judgment of God in that second Artodian sense, judgment of God by man. It is the implementation of all of base multiplicity towards one, towards coherence, longevity, reproduction, all of these things which God represents for, for Arto. But surely if there is more to the faster, for the ones who risk death and throw themselves into the strange mixtures of speeds and slownesses. Surely there is something in the unwise, to accidental or even bloody-minded error, which must be fundamental to experimentation, to truly investigating what a body is capable of, indeed to inventing what a body is capable of, and thus wrecking any hegemony of a plane of possibility over a plane of imminence. Must we not join another Deleuze in saying, apropos Artaud, in fact, 
it would be irresponsible to turn a blind eye to the danger of collapse in such endeavours, but they're worth it. Or yet further, for us to say that it would be irresponsible to turn a blind eye to the danger of collapse, but it is necessary. In a forensic and historical journey around imminence in Deleuze's oeuvre, Christian Kerslake names this rare Deleuzean terminological constant, imminence, as perhaps the problem inspiring his work. Referring to Deleuze's 1968 Spinoza and the Problem of Expression, Kerslake asserts that absolute difference is shown to be formally coherent in the Spinoza book but its existence could not be assumed without recourse to an ontological argument. The procedure of starting with absolute imminence risks falling back into pre-philosophical presupposition. But in fact, absolute imminence lies at the end of the system rather than its beginning. It is the telos towards which cognition and critique move. To this we might add that it is the telos towards which Deleuze's experimenting body moves, and as such, that we do know what a body is capable of. In Deleuze's reading. What becomes clear, even relatively early in Deleuze's writing, is that imminence is not simply something which emerges from and subsists within thought. It's not something which we simply find ourselves in. It must not make that error of rediscovering the transcendence within imminence itself. Rather, it is life as imminence which must be found and made at the juncture of praxis or ethics and ontology, where life and thought Nafim and Papi, animal and stars meet. As the plane of imminence always presents two powers, power of being and power of thinking. When Deleuze and Guattari come to write of imminence in what is philosophy as pre-philosophical, it is not in the temporal sense of anteriority, so much as it is in the sense of an enveloping of philosophy, the simultaneous synthesis and anamnesis of an ontological anteriority. This is the climax of the Spinoza and us chapter of Spinoza Practical Philosophy, just as it is the Spinoza whom Deleuze and Guattari crown once again in what is philosophy. They write, Spinoza, the infinite becoming philosopher, he showed, drew up and thought the best plane of imminence, that is the purest, the one that does not hand itself over to the transcendent or restore any transcendent, the one that inspires the fewest illusions, bad feelings, and erroneous perceptions. So a temporarily, a temporarily anterior understanding of pre-philosophical would be precisely the re-establishing of a transcendence. That is, it would make thought only an excrescence of imminence, and so not its affirmation nor its very production. But it is only when imminence is no longer imminent to something other than itself that it is possible to speak of a plane of imminence. Imminence cannot prioritise, it must bind concept and affect. It is at the same time that which must be thought and that which cannot be thought. It is the non-thought within thought. And the, the reference to those early Arto letters to the Jacques Riviere is, um, is clear here. An outside more distant than any external world because it is an inside deeper than any internal world. Indeed, perhaps this is the supreme act of philosophy not so much to think the plane of imminence, as to show that it is there, unthought in every plane. Imminence, then, the best plane of imminence, is not merely that which precedes philosophy, nor is it simply that which philosophy constructs. It is the affirmation and weaving of the plane of imminence, the showing of the possibility of the impossible, or what we might call the incompossible. As the maintenance and overcoming of opposition, this is what incompossible would be. And perhaps this is not entirely novel. As Deleuze and Guattari point out, the Greek image of thought already involved the madness of the double turning away, which launched thought into infinite wondering rather than into error. Now, Deleuze's spinism tick, if I may call it that, does not entirely dismiss error, but it does instrumentalise it. In this way, the tick is very much of the Enlightenment, it would seem. There is a clear notion of linear progression in which erring, tendency to the pessimal limit, is flexed toward the pursuit of the optimal limit. So there's no sort of power of the false, really, in a, in a true sense. 
We must think beyond this if we are to properly risk experimentation. A certain vertigo, the experiment of groundless and degrounding, an envelope of absolute contingency, not laboratory conditions and protocols. Deleuze and Guattari know the precedent. And they say, as Nietzsche succeeded in making us understand, thought is creation, not will to truth. The experimental milieu, which is as much life as it is thought and their intractability, must be understood as riddled with dangers and illusions, which are to be neither simply dismissed nor twisted away from themselves in the pursuit of the one. Rather, if they are to be differentiated at all, it is in their capacity to produce. And yet deeper within this diagram of thought, there is the diagram of a passage through unthought, through the pre-philosophical, which must be woven in and woven back into, not abandoned, sloughed off, disavowed. Deleuze explains, there is in this way an incapacity of thought, which remains at its core even after it has acquired the capacity determinable as creation. This imageless thought sees, quote, a set of ambiguous signs arise, which become diagrammatic features or infinite movements, and which take on a value by right, whereas in the other images of thought, so the classical and the, that of the Enlightenment, they were simply derisory facts excluded from a selection. As Kleist or Artaud suggests, thought as such begins to exhibit snarls, squeals, stammers. It talks in tongues and screams, which leads it to create, or try to. It is then through Artaud that we might confront this difficulty, this ambiguity, this ambiguity in thought bound to its double, and the painful and infinite passage between the two. As Deleuze and Guattari well realise, the stakes are high. So they say, we have no reason to take pride in this image of thought, which involves much suffering without glory, and indicates the degree to which thinking has become increasingly difficult. Imminence. Experimentation, then, is itself already the affirmation of imminence, and needs must, I suggest, that it be experimentation of the risk of transcendence, lest it rely on one. The pursuit of error which enables it to reenact the folding of transcendence into the imminent, a coupling, recoupling, or binding without instrumentalization. This is the sense of Bataille's non knowledge as the throwing oneself off the summit, just as it, just as it is the coincident of Artaud's two senses of cruelty that which names being as determination, and that which is the practical process of overcoming. So it's the cruelty of being and the theatre of cruelty, concept and affect. Kerslake and Deleuze are quite right that imminence is the vertigo of philosophy. But this vertigo must involve a proper falling, a body falling, not only in psychosomatic image. So it's the ascension to a place from which to fall, the practical putting at risk of the body and the conceptual putting at risk of imminence or even a thought, as it, as it reeks on our thought. And this is not the falling of Deleuze's Spinoza's tick. Okay? It's not the let yourself fall onto the man or the passes beneath the branch, but disoriented falling, uh, falling after rising. It's verticalism and vertigo, to, to, borrow, um, to borrow terms from Eugene Schoenbatz. It's the making of that first and most dangerous error and the subsequent or resultant undoing of that error and thereby of error per se. And this is quite different to moving away from the pessimal limit. It is overcoming without instrumental reduction, the embodied incompossibility of life and death, thought and unthought, which Arto calls Le Mans. And it is this which for Arto weaves the plane of imminence, which wrecks transcendence, which has done with the judgment of God in both of the genitive valencies, uh, both sides of the finite infinite disjunction, if you like. So it's God no longer judging man, man no longer judging God, no organism, no organs. So to conclude, Arto's body without organs can be associated with three main instantiations of imminence. Plenitude found through removal, which is inadequately covered by the figuration of anti-production in anti-Oedipus. 
the conjunctive synthesis of the incompossible finite and infinite, so life and death in the figure of the mummy, the, the walking dead, and all the undead mummy, and idiocy as the incompossible synthesis of disorganized, impersonal thought with unthought, away from error and toward the seminal productive power of the event. Okay, so this is the, the reading of Arto that, that Deleuze takes from Blanchot. Momoism, as it is figured in the late poem cycle, Arto de Momo, is the conjunctive synthesis of these last two. So it's the figure of the idiot mummy. Okay? The fourfold incompossible synthesis of thought, unthought, life, death. Through Arto, contrary to Deleuze and Deleuze's Spinoza, this becomes the true name of the best plane of imminence. It is where death, life, thought and unthought are all bound into one body as both a latency, it finds itself there, and as its practice, so not a telos, but the, a latency uh, that is to be whipped, just as Arto talks of uh, an innateness uh, which has to be whipped. When he says, I am he who in order to be must whip his innateness. So beyond the dogmatic image of the merely possible and connected, beyond joy and instrumentalised error, we find uh, what Clayton Meshleman has called a, mo a multifoliate binding of attraction repulsion for all materials and sensations. The spinner's the spinizi <coughs> the spinnerization of the body without organs, which Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari pursue would subject the body without organs of Arto Le Momo to the pursuit of a singularised good which it must reproduce. That is, it would make of it an image. And in their monomania for connectivity and joy, would fail to protect the body from the forces it is opened up to in pursuit of that joy. A body without organs is not joyful. Um, this is this is what Arto is talking about when he talks about the drawings to murder magic, okay? being opened up to these forces by magic, by, um, by connectivity in this way, and, um, and that has to be undone, in a sense. <clears throat> to appropriate the body without organs from Arto's name can only be seen as a violence to that body, to his body, which is also his body of work. It is a violent removal of its capacity to name itself beyond representation, to think beyond image, to whip a nameness. As such, this misnomer must be condemned for ushering in a new genital image. It is, to borrow a series of figures from Arto's late work, to remove Arto's balls from his cum. It is the insidious nocturnal theft of his sperm and the placing of that puissant seminal fluid into a glass jar, a mislabeled receptacle in which force is abstracted away from Arto's idiotic, undead body and made an image, an image of the ethics, perhaps. The unilateral difference between finite and infinite, which Deleuze does at time affirm, um, and which he finds in Spinoza, in a sense, uh, relies on a binding of the finite and the infinite under the protocols of the infinite alone. Arto superannuates to this his own passage through death and through unthought, and so also uses the puissance of the finite to bind his fourfold incompossible synthesis from both sides of that finite infinite disjunction. This is the absurdity and the necessity of the fourfold of Momoism, which the body without organs lives out and through which it risks, finds, and affirms the best plane of imminence. Its proper name can be none other than Arto Le Mans. And yet as brutal as Deleuze and Guattari's rending of Arto from himself is, and we must not underestimate the cruelty of that simple sort of jar labeling phrase, Spinoza's body without organs, their violence is at least well-meaning. After all, which body of work more steadfastly than theirs attempts to answer that question which Arto de Momo cannot himself answer? At that point when it is necessary to choose between renouncing being a man and becoming an obvious madman, what guarantees do the obvious madmen of the world 
haven't been nursed by the authentically living. Any questions?